Thank you, Manori. And uh, thank you all, um, friends, for joining today. Uh, thank you in particular to uh, Aya Chanda, uh, who is currently on retreat, who invited me in the first place to um, share some Dhamma this summer. Well, she is um, hopefully taking the opportunity to go deeply into the Dhamma, deeply in uh, to retreat mode at this Vasa. At MT Cloud Monastery, where I currently am, usually the Vasa is the busiest time of the year, really. <laughs> so uh, right now there is, in fact, a whole like Sunday program happening at, in the led by other monastics um, in the other part of the monastery. <laughs> so it's good to uh, good to be here with all of you to practice. So we can start with um, um, a period of meditation practice. So if you're not in a seated position already, you can take the opportunity to find a comfortable position. And making sure that your back is uh, up straight. Take a few deep breaths. And relax the entire body from the top of the head to the tip of the toes. Relaxing any point of tension that we might find in the body. Usually we can find some tension in the neck or the shoulders, the belly. The jaw. And releasing it. We can just allow ourselves to be here. without anything to do. No coming, no going, no doing. Allowing ourselves to just dwell in the present moment. Simply abiding here and now. Dropping anything that might come our way, any thoughts. Any emotions. Any desire. Any aversion. Any preoccupation, we can just let everything slip away. Without picking it up.
without holding on to it. and allowing ourselves just to be here. And we can now slowly bring our attention to the breath, to the simple act of breathing in and breathing out. You can simply become aware of it, welcome it, without forcing the breath, without changing the breath. but accepting and acknowledging the breath just as it is. Acknowledging as it's happening, whether it's long or short. Whether it's coarse or subtle. By simply being present with the breath, we can know the breath.
And with each in-breath and out-breath, we can train ourselves to become aware of the entire body. Inflating and deflating in every moment, like a balloon. And as we're becoming more inclusive and more aware of the body, we can also start tranquilizing the body, calming the body with every in-breath and out-breath. welcoming in the mind that element of tranquility that we can find in the body and intentionally expanding it and cultivating it. As we keep being mindful of our breathing in and breathing out.
and with a smile on our face. We can acknowledge how by tranquilizing the body, the body becomes more and more pleasant. With each in-breath and out-breath, we can train ourselves to emphasize more and more grow more and more. Those pleasant aspects, pleasant feelings. I come with a tranquil body and a tranquil breathing. Acknowledging the pleasant feelings and growing the pleasant feelings with every in breath and out breath.
And as we're getting closer to the end of our meditation practice, we can acknowledge that element of tranquility, that element of peace in the mind. That element of happiness. and contentment. And we can thank ourselves for putting these conditions in place. We can thank us, ourselves for our practice that is liberating us from suffering. And we can now bring our hands in Anjali and say together three times a sadhu. 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 And now we can open slowly our eyes and come out of meditation practice. And if you need to stretch a little bit, now is the right time to do so. Right, and at this point, we can start by paying homage to our original teacher, Shakyamuni Buddha, the reason why we're gathered here for today. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma Sambutasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Rato Samma Sambutasa Bhutam Dhammam Sangham Namasami hmm. So today, um, we're going to talk about sex, <laughs> uh, more specifically sexual misconduct. Um, so I assume that all of you uh, at one point um, have taken uh, the three refuges and five precepts, hopefully actually um, for life, <laughs> right? And so as um, lay people uh, do, um, normally take the five precepts. So the first precepts of, uh, we take the precept of not killing, uh, then the second precept of not stealing, then the third precept of not engaging in sexual misconduct, and the fourth precept of not lying, and the fifth precept of um, not using intoxicants. The fifth precept, precept is always the least sort of popular, both uh, East and West. But today we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> We're going to talk about the third one. And so there's um, actually a lot of um, different sort of 
rumors that we can hear in uh, in uh, Buddhist communities, um, both within Theravada, actually, if one goes to perhaps uh, Sri Lankan temples or Thai temples uh, or Burmese temples and so forth, but also within Mahayana, right? If one goes to the Chinese temple or the Vietnamese temple, uh, the Korean temple um, and so forth, uh, there can be actually, I've noticed that throughout the years, a lot of different ideas on um, actually the Tibetan temple even even uh, even has a different sort of idea, also a different definition of what actually sexual misconduct is. And so sometimes we might hear, for example, that uh, included in, in sexual misconduct, there is, uh, for example, having sexual intercourse with uh, uh, people that we're not married with. Uh, so there can be the sort of sense that it has to be within a marriage. Um, there's also sometimes the connotation that, that being divorced um, can can be can qualify as sexual misconduct. Uh, sometimes there's also different iterations on um, homosexuality uh, or on the type of actually sexual intercourse that we're having. So, uh, yeah, at the very beginning, I was uh, very, um, yeah, mesmerized <laughs> by all of these different interpretations that actually we don't really see in the in the early Buddhist texts. So there is no such thing um, that we can find in the Nikayas that uh, that spells this out. So I was actually quite curious in uh, in trying to really understand what did the Buddha say in terms of um, sexuality? What is actually the definition of an appropriate way of using our sexuality? And you know, as for us monastics, it's actually very, very easy because we just stop having sex altogether. So then, you know, it's kind of like not really a problem, right? <laughs> um, you just uh, remove the, the issue altogether. Uh, so we have, an, in this regard, a much easier <laughs> and simple uh, practice than lay people. But for lay people, actually, this can be a little bit, um, yeah, something to really pay attention to when one is actually not um not celibate uh, but actually when one is using uh, one's sexual conduct it's important to understand really what that means um in accordance with dhamma and not because we hear it somewhere not because um it's done in this way in a particular culture because then maybe you know it will be done differently in another culture but rather always going back to back to the roots going back to um yeah what the buddha said um and actually when we go back to the the early texts um it's very interesting because uh it's only very kind of clear <laughs> only for one uh sort of uh group of people actually uh which is um you know straight men <laughs> so uh the actual definition of um that we find in the suttas um, well, I mean, the precept that we take is not to engage in sexual misconduct, and that is actually gender neutral. But the definition that we find in the suttas, at least the only one that I could find uh, throughout the, the years, is so if you have found an, a different <laughs> or more information, please let me know. I would be very grateful. Um, is really actually um, essentially this one. I have it right here and I will quote it um, to you. And it says, he misconducts himself in sensual pleasures. He has intercourse with women who are protected by their mother, father, mother and father, brother, sister, relatives who have a husband who are protected by law, and even with those who are guard landed in token of betrothal. This is from uh, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, right? So this is the definition that we see in the suttas of what actually is sexual misconduct. Um, and so the idea is, of course, if we are refraining from sexual misconduct, we're not, not engaging in this. So the question arises. Um, so what happens if actually, for example, it's a woman? <laughs> does that mean that um, a woman does not, um, you know, there's no chance for a woman, uh, even a straight woman, we're not even talking about uh, LGBTQIA plus folks, but rather uh, just a straight woman. Does it mean that actually one, you know, if one cheats on their partner, for example, they're not 
practicing uh, sexual misconduct? <laughs> Clearly not. So we can kind of assume a little bit what would be sort of the not engaging in sexual misconduct when it comes to a straight woman. So then the question arises actually when we're talking about uh, every other sort of group of people that is not in this definition. And we can kind of somewhat um, understand it with, with a few ways. Uh, one of them is actually thinking about how we understood, for example, the definition of, of basically uh, sexual misconduct for women. And it's basically applying no differently than uh, how us monastics do for um, uh, sort of occasions where we don't have specific precepts that tackle, you know, kind of like the modern world. Uh, the Buddha actually gave us uh, the four great standards within uh, the Vinaya. So basically looking at um, what in the past has been declared allowable and non-allowable uh, by the Buddha, uh, what has been declared permissible and non-permissible by the Buddha and actually applying the same standard. So seeing if it's actually very similar um, and, uh, and then applying it to this day and age. So this is basically essentially what already um, people have been doing, for example, with this particular precept for lay people, right? When it comes to women. So it's actually understood everywhere, you know, uh, that uh, one uh, does not misconduct themselves in sensual pleasures and does not have intercourse uh, with people who are not consenting, right? So when, then we can see that that is uh, equiv um, equivalent for both men and women. And so we can also go back to then uh, essentially why are we practicing the precepts? Why are we practicing anything in, in Buddhism? So we're practicing everything in Buddhism to attain the cessation of suffering, right? And so we're practicing in accordance to the Noble Eightfold Path, the way out of the cessation of suffering. And so we see uh, that uh, how we conduct ourselves sexually uh, goes within uh, right action, right? So the definition that we see of um, right action within the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, which is uh, usually defined as uh, the abstinence from um, destruction of life, obviously. Uh, so uh, that has to do with uh, not killing. Uh, also the abstinence from not taking what is um, not given, uh, so not stealing and every kind of derivation of that. And then uh, the abstinence from sexual misconduct. And then we can go a little bit uh, further up. How is actually right action what is what are the supports for right action? Well, the supports for right action are clearly right intention, right? And so how is right intention defined? Um, it's the intention of renunciation, right? It's the intention of non-ill will. And it's the intention of not harming. That is what the Buddha essentially calls right intention. And so when we think about then the appropriate way to conduct ourselves sexually, then it comes naturally by these definitions that it has to be in a way that um, implies a certain degree of renunciation, implies a certain degree of uh, not harming, right? <laughs> and so when it comes to uh, renunciation, for example, it's very clear. So if we are, for example, in... Um, in a relationship with someone, then obviously if there is another person that we're attracted to, then we can renounce <laughs> that craving. We can let go of that craving and be respectful and not harm ourselves and others uh, that we are in the, in the relationship with. Or if the person, if we're single and the other person um, is in a relationship themselves, right? And so it comes clearly, we understand that by engaging in a relationship with someone who has a previous commitment, then of course those people will be harmed. But if we're talking about, uh, for example, a relationship with someone um, of the same sex or the opposite sex, it doesn't really matter. As long as the people are consensual, there is nothing that 
that seems to be harming anyone in the in this predicament or if someone is married or not married it doesn't really matter but definitely what matters is the consent obviously if there is no consent we can see how harm comes into being or if we're in a position of power also we can see how um, the consent is a little bit difficult to to be found of the person if the person is underage we can see also once again go back to the definition of sexual misconduct right so perhaps um, the definition of sexual misconduct of the straight man in ancient india can seem a little bit dated but actually not that much if we really look at it and then once again apply the four standards the four great standards that the buddha uh, invited us to apply to right so it's basically pretty much talking about also the legality uh, the responsibility uh, that the person the people that we're engaging in um, in, in a relationship with are and so being respectful of all those boundaries respectful of all the uh, all the people that um are in the relationship and we see that also then the matter the the number <laughs> of people within the relationships also doesn't matter too much in Buddhism, actually. <laughs> Since the very beginning, um, that we're not really talking about it necessarily having to be just two people. Uh, it doesn't matter. There's no actually mention of um, marriage or divorce. Um, there doesn't mean, doesn't seem to be a preoccupation of all of that. But rather, the emphasis is on consent. The emphasis is on non-harming. And when we see, um, when we delve deeply in why actually these definitions instead today uh, in different Buddhist countries might seem a little bit different than what we actually um, might derive by the usage of the grade four standard, the four great standards um, that we've done in, uh, in the past couple of minutes. Uh, if we ask ourselves this question and we delve into the history of perhaps Sri Lanka, we uh, delve into the history of Burma, we uh, delve into the history of a lot of different countries, we can see that actually a lot of these definitions are very, very recent. Some uh, perhaps are actually um, only 100 years old, some are a couple hundred years old. And um, a lot of them actually have to do with uh, the um, history of colonization of uh, Buddhist countries. And um, it's actually very, very interesting because um, these days, if one goes to Sri Lanka, homosexuality, for example, is a crime. Um, so there's a sense, a big, big sense, um, as far as it's been my experience, uh, that people really have a a kind of idea that that is really wrong. But actually where that sense, that current sense comes from um, is from actually, <laughs> once again, colonization. Uh, so up, if I remember correctly, up until the 19th century, uh, it was completely legal uh, to homosexuality, uh, was completely legal in, uh, in Sri Lanka. And it was actually uh, British law, the Brits um, forced uh, the those laws into the country um, to essentially make sodomy uh, uh, something that would be penalized, something that was uh, going to be, uh, yeah, that was against the law. And even before the Brits, actually, if I remember correctly, it was the Portuguese that went, um, you know, around the 1600s, uh, to Sri Lanka and they actually saw how it was basically not a problem <laughs> the kind of gender expression and um, homosexuality was completely was not something that people were talking about because it was just not a problem <laughs> and they were obviously quite horrified um, they were also quite horrified about a lot of different things um, also when uh, when Europeans started going to Southeast Asia also they were quite horrified of how uh, different people actually would wear not that much clothing um, when going to the temple. <laughs> so actually, we we see also a lot of the dress codes that are currently present in um, in temples uh, in uh, in Thailand included, even though it was not colonized, but it was very influenced by uh, the sort of policies that were happening 
around around in other countries that were in fact colonized um yeah there was a bit of a of an idea like what what are these people doing why are they wearing or rather not wearing the appropriate clothing um uh in the temples and so it was the same uh when it had to do with uh the the sort of perceived sexual misconduct based on um judeo-christian values right so it's uh, clear uh as uh for pretty much anyone who is uh, born and raised in um, in the West, uh, we kind of have a big, very strong sense. At least that's my case, uh, being in Italy, uh, being born in Italy and raised in Italy, even though my parents weren't Catholic, uh, really, or didn't give me a Catholic upbringing. Uh, there was definitely a very strong sense of what is appropriate um, sexual conduct according to Catholicism and what is not. And definitely... A lot of these concepts were very, um, yeah, when I found them in Buddhism, I was like, hmm, that, that looks very familiar. <laughs> but then it's quite interesting when we look at the scriptures, once again, when we where we see this kind of, um, yeah, complete lack thereof mentioning on the part of the Buddha. The Buddha seems to be completely uninterested with whom lay people are having sex with. <laughs> <laughs> he's completely uninterested in even like actually uh encouraging people to uh get married <laughs> uh, there is actually complete disinterest in uh, encouraging lay people to procreate <laughs> as a matter of fact actually historically buddhist countries have had uh, quite a low birth rate <laughs> when you compare it to um yeah countries of on the other hand, to your Christian descent, uh, it's quite recent, actually, that in Christian countries, um, there's a low birth rate. Um, but that has to do more with the secularization of the countries rather than the, the religion. Then in fact, the religion, and usually sex is um, one of the other definitions, usually in other religions, is to um, yeah, be essentially appropriate for the sake of procreation. But there is none of that, actually, that we find um, in uh, the definitions that the Buddha gives us, um, there is nowhere, none of that mentioned. So it's very much important to keep that in mind so that we're not um, misjudging our sexual conduct. And most importantly, we're not misjudging the sexual conduct of others, but rather instead uh, appreciating the fact that uh, people are or encouraging rather um, a conduct that doesn't harm themselves or others. And that is what is uh, my understanding in accordance with Dhamma. So these are a few words. Uh, maybe we can open it up uh, for question and answer <laughs> or comments. Actually, we would love to hear your thoughts. And maybe perhaps if you found in the suttas some other definition, some other information, <laughs> I'm all ears. All right, Benjamin. I think Hello. you. Hello. Uh, so I, I always was interested in this uh, precept because it's the only one that wasn't obvious what it means, and I quite quickly arrived at the working definition for myself that oh, I'll just go with sticking with sexual conduct that's not harmful, in the broadest possible sense. And that seems to work pretty well. But my my question is, if it's such a narrow and also nebulous definition and not really talked about in the suttas, why does it exist as a separate precept? Why doesn't it just fall under non-harm? <laughs> Thank you so much, Benjamin. Well, I would say that it's actually extremely important. So uh, the first Parajika for us monastics um, is actually uh, has to do with sex. So actually sex is extremely, extremely important because it's also the kind of sort of strongest um, uh, pulse that we have. Uh, it's the strongest kind of animalistic instinct 
right? We are animals, let's not forget that. And when we look at other animals, you know, if we have pets and everything, uh, before they we neuter them <laughs> or spay them, we can actually see how strong those instincts are. And um, it's very important to recollect that we're not really that sophisticated as animals. <laughs> we're pretty much exactly um, like cats and dogs and so forth foxes and horses and and whatever um it's just that we actually do have a sort of i would say humans have a higher degree of um of capability of restraining themselves or of understanding definitely the dhamma <laughs> and understanding better the implications of one's actions right so this is kind of like also we see why the you know in buddhism we say that the human realm is actually the sort of perfect uh realm um where to attain awakening because we we don't have too much of a heavenly sort of state of existence like the gods that, that you know kind of like having a great time and not having any type of suffering and really you know um yeah being a little bit too obsessed with that. And at the same time, we're also not overwhelmed by instincts. We're not overwhelmed by, um, uh, yeah, you know, the by suffering, which is actually any realm below the human realm, which is the animal realm. And then, of course, all of the infernal realms. So we can also see that, you know, we have a monastery cat here, the monastic cat, Teddy. And um, similarly to the monastic cat, Stan, before him, <laughs> goes through a lot of struggles uh, with his instincts. And he does not have the Dhamma to actually, um, or rather, he has the Dhamma. I mean, he's definitely in a Dhamma, Dhammic environment where he is catching a few things here and there. I see another cat friend <laughs> uh, that is uh um today with us <laughs> hello cat friend um so yeah of course our our cat friends or dog friends or, or whomever have a bit of a an ability to access the dhamma but they can't really learn the dhamma to the extent that we can so for example they don't have teachings on um they don't have precepts. They don't know the precepts and they can't then use the precepts as guidelines to restrain one, one conduct, to reflect also on one conduct. You know, another uh, definition of sila that usually is translated as morality, a sila is a habit. So essentially when we take on a sila, we take on a new habit. So we take on the uh, the habit, for example, of not killing, of not stealing, of not lying, of not using sexual, uh, sorry, um, of not using intoxicants. And then we take also the uh, the habit of the new habit of restraining ourselves in our in our sexuality. And I feel like actually it's very, very important to have a precept on that once again, because it's the sort of, it's the most um, instinctual way through which we will misbehave since the history of time, you know, <laughs> there's been a lot of um, harm done with um, one's sexuality. We can, see, we can see it in the history. Every single country has the same sort of history. Actually, that's also the inception of the, uh, the patriarchy. The creation of patriarchal systems start uh, by fundamentally, um, you know, groups, tribes going uh, to from, you know, maybe one village to the other village um, and um, usually raping uh, the, the women there and abducting them and bringing them uh, to their own village and, um, you know, impregnating them and then basically turning them into one of their own. And that's been the sort of easiest way, essentially, through which uh, patriarchal sort of societies have been um, have been instituted. It's very interesting that we have actually a sutta um, uh, where the Buddha gives uh, the instructions uh, to the Lichavis, where it says uh, essentially the principles of non-decline. And one of them is, uh, one of the principles is precisely not to do that, not to go and <laughs> rape <laughs> women and <laughs> bring them back to, um, you know, their villages. So we see actually, you know, how the Buddha was quite non-patriarchal apparently. <laughs> It's very interesting when I started reading the history of patriarchy and then finding, you know, kind of like the the opposite teachings in the 
uh, in as said as reported as said by the Buddha. But anyway, uh, parenthesis aside, so it's very important to spell out um, the how this comes into play. And so this being said, of course, the suttas, of course, the Buddhist texts um, have been transmitted, right, in a particular way. They've been transmitted in a particular language. They've been transmitted um, in a per by particular people at one place and time, uh, right? So they've been transmitted through a specific perspective. Um, and that is our job in every single field to understand what, to go kind of... Um, to go beyond the literal sort of meaning <laughs> and understand the implications of Dhamma behind the text, right? So not be limited by the text, but rather understand the Dhamma, the universal Dhamma underneath the text. Otherwise, you know, um, you know, none of us actually could could get any teachings from there because. You know, none of us is Indian. I think today nobody's Indian, you know, <laughs> right? Um, so um, unless one is actually from India, you know, the Buddha is always talking to Indians and there's lots of, you know, references to Indian society. So then if we start getting into that line of thinking, we're like, well, you know, uh, there's nobody talking about Italians there. Or nobody's talking about British people there and nobody's talking about you know, even Thai people there and so forth. So then we can get very like narrow-minded. But instead, when we actually understand that it doesn't really matter, you know, the ethnicity of the people, but rather what the Buddha is addressing is actually those traits of mind or the arahats are, uh, are talking about those traits of mind, then we can understand a little bit more the Dhamma. And so it's no different, once again, with uh, the precept of um on sexual misconduct there is the definition uh once again of what sexual misconduct is and it is uh through you know it's expressed in um in a language um that um made probably sense back in the day um very specific once again to you know a male householder <laughs> right and probably back then you know whoever heard uh, these words, it didn't matter if they were, you know, a woman or a man, uh, didn't matter what exactly their predicament was, um, they would understand what was their sort of scope, what was, how were they supposed to practice um, this precept. But then, of course, as society changes uh, throughout the centuries, then it can get a little bit less literal, less um, less intuitive. And that's where actually we have to investigate the Dhamma. We have to understand the Dhamma. And that's why the Buddha also gave us, as I was mentioning, uh, the four great standards in the Vinaya. So to really look and, um, and understand what is similar to what has been allowed and what is not similar to what is not allowed and really investigate how does this fit within the larger picture of the Dhamma. So one of the greatest things about Buddhism, about the teachings of the Buddha, is that actually everything makes sense, first and foremost, from, uh, you know, like an intellectual standpoint, you know, from logical inference, everything actually makes sense. <laughs> and um, I think that's also why in this day and age, a lot of us are actually, um, a lot of people are you know converting to to buddhism because we're we're living in such a rational era uh, that it's a little bit difficult to take things out of blind faith but up until very recently it was kind of like the opposite right so um different ways of different types of faith uh different types of spiritual paths were um a little bit more accessible for folks um and i feel like now instead it's uh, the great sort of years for for buddhism because we can kind of like go okay i mean i don't know about karma and rebirth but really it does make sense you know when you actually like look at the larger picture in terms of how does that fit in within um the the sort of logical system of buddhism right of the teachings of the buddha and so that's what we can do um, we can we can use that to our advantage to really understand and investigate and ask questions and see, I mean, how can is this in contradiction with other elements of the Dhamma or is it actually supported by other elements of the Dhamma? And um, in that way, then I think we can at least have an idea and 
um, than a working hypothesis through which we can start practicing. And obviously with the presets, it's very simple. Once we start practicing with the precepts, we can really evaluate our mind and go, okay, is this in accordance with Dhamma or not? And um, how do we know? With the question, is suffering increasing or decreasing? <laughs> So it's very, very simple, right? So whenever we are actually mis doing something harmful, like killing, for example, insects, uh, well, our suffering is increasing. And when we stop killing uh, or harming insects or other sentient beings, um, our suffering decreases. So it's the same when we start kind of tailoring our, our sexuality, our conduct in every possible way. Um, our suffering decreases. <laughs> so I hope that answered your question. <laughs> All right, and Leon. Thank you very much. Yeah, I agree that I, it's a very important question, especially for lay people, and especially I think in the West where um, sexual norms have become more free in the past few decades. And I feel like I have a lot of friends who are either, let's say, Muslim or Christian. And uh, for them, it's just no sex outside of marriage. And all of my other secular friends are kind of just trying to gather what pleasures that they can. And nobody's really in my position, which is uh, somewhat between the two. And I'm, uh, I, but I think the principle of ahimsa or harmlessness is absolutely critical. But I, I also worry that like one doesn't have to necessarily be Buddhist or have taken the precepts in order to understand that you shouldn't engage in sexual acts that harm people. Um, the trick, I think, and the difficult thing is that sometimes even when we engage in purely consensual uh, sexual acts with partners that are enthusiastic and everything, there's still sometimes harm that comes about, right? Even if we've ever been in a relationship, we can see that things start out well, and then eventually we begin harming each other in different ways, you know, subtly and uh, and uh minutely and it's it's very easy i think to um to reason backwards from what we want as lay people who aren't like constrained by the vinaya you know i can easily look at something and be like oh okay actually what i want is perfectly fine i should do it <laughs> or i can i can look at it and work backwards until i arrive at a point where i'm like yeah it, it's great um, but if I'm honest with myself, every time I've, I've, you know, uh, been in a relationship, there has, there's always been like an element of acquisitiveness or an element of possessiveness or, uh, lust, which then leads to a kind of intoxication of the mind that's always in there somewhere. And like, as a lay person, it worries me. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And also for being so frank and honest, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's why I'm celibate. <laughs> As we say in Italian, you're kind of um, breaking into an open door. <laughs> like as in, uh, there's obviously that's, you know, it wouldn't be a monastic if I didn't feel that way. <laughs> um, so that's the challenge for, I have a lot of compassion for you, lay people that have much harder practice. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so that's why we have to be also realistic and we're talking about harm reduction. Um, so obviously, once again, sex, it's a, a really strong form of craving. And um, if we're not careful, I mean, it's basically a little bit of big giant fire that we are, you know, dealing with. So yeah. That's uh, why in Buddhist countries, for example, also lay people twice a month at least uh, practice um, the eight precepts, which means that uh, from sexual misconduct, they actually uh, take on the practice of celibacy as well. So to train themselves to reduce sort of that tension. Um, and as we say, also in Italian today, I have a lot of Italian sayings, appetite comes through eating. <laughs> so that's also why there is that kind of fasting um also for lay people uh in uh in the buddhist tradition that goes back uh to the time of the buddha right so it doesn't matter if we're active um i mean yeah it doesn't matter you know if we're 
lay people are not, but it's good to actually practice celibacy from time to time. I mean, for monastics, we always have to practice celibacy. That's not an option. <laughs> for Adjika, otherwise, we're not monastic. We cease to be monastics immediately. Um, but for lay people, it's very important to, yeah, really focus on the on the reduction of harm and also noticing these unwholesome um, mind states that come with the action of sex. And also starting to kind of um, unwrapping the wholesome from the unwholesome. So, of course, whenever we are in a relationship with anyone, um, it's just the nature of the unenlightened mind, obviously, to have both a lot of love and a lot of craving and a lot of possession and a lot of jealousy and a lot of, you know, me, 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 mine, 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 right? And also a lot of like, may you be well, may you be happy, may you be peaceful and so forth, right? So a lot of metta. And we tend to think that all of that is love. But actually what we can do is start, as you were, I think you're completely capable of distinguishing one from the other from the description that you've um, offered earlier. Uh, but like starting to kind of, yeah, separate more intentionally and distinguish and evaluate these mental states and then intentionally nourishing the wholesome and starving out the unwholesome, right? And once again, practicing celibacy from time to time, going on retreats. So doing also practices of celibacy for longer periods of time, then we can eat less and have a bit of a less appetite <laughs> and be content a little bit more with, um, yeah, with what is wholesome. Because we can think about it also in terms of, um, you know, kind of like just eating. Eating is a similar thing. You know, we can, uh, as monastics, we can remove a lot of uh, sort of use of uh, sensuality, right? We don't watch movies. We don't go to shows. We don't do that. I mean, we're like really boring people, right? <laughs> when it comes to worldly terms, but we still have to eat. And actually then food becomes this like huge um, sort of source of sensual pleasure um, and entertainment, um, but that's also why we have precepts. We can't eat 24 seven, right? We can um, only eat in the morning. And before, you know, as a monastic, actually, that was my biggest defilement. When I entered monastic life, I was like, oh dear, this is just so difficult. <laughs> so terrible. Uh, but you start training yourself and then you start also seeing how these certain limitations actually offer opportunities to look at those um yeah, those, those craving, you know, tendencies of mind and rewire them and then go like, well, actually what is supportive um, for my spiritual practice? Mm, well, I only have actually, you know, one meal a day, um, right? So do I want to eat mostly cake? I don't think so. <laughs> that will be very difficult to then to support my, my spiritual practice. So you start renouncing and you're like, actually, I really want some some vegetables right now <laughs> I really want um yeah rice and dal but want it not in that kind of like mm, I mean it's also delicious rice and all but <laughs> it's not it becomes less about that and more about the sort of wow this is really nutritious much more supportive of the body and the mind than say the burger right uh, or whatever it is that can be offered. So we start making healthier choices with, um, right, when we actually look at our experience. And it's the same, I would say, I think for, for lay people, if uh, one really takes on these uh, precepts, as we were saying, as taking on new habits of mind. So instead of going like, oh, I want to do this and I want to do that, and there's no end to craving, there is no end to, you know, all the sort of possible iterations, which is why sexual conduct then easily can become sexual misconduct. But if instead we actually contain it, we, yeah, we protect ourselves and we protect others. We have certain like limits, um, then actually it can become something really healthy, something supportive, something that uh, actually can be also a way of generating wholesome mind states um, towards others. So, so it's not that, you know, like Buddhism is like sex phobic or something and there's not, none of that, um, you know, there's not like, oh, this is, 
mm -mm. yeah there's, there's not a kind of puritan um, attitude towards sexuality it's just obviously the acknowledgement that is a big uh sorts of great uh, craving which is why for monastics, it makes sense to avoid it altogether since we're trying to be fast-tracked towards <laughs> enlightenment, right? <laughs> but for lay people, obviously, it's a different type of practice. So one just needs to learn how to reduce the harm, I would say. Hope that helped. And there are some messages on the chat. Uh, so... One person says, forgive me if I understood you wrongly. Did you say that it is okay to have sex outside marriage if it is with mutual consent? If that is the case, is it okay to have sex with multiple partners and have children from different men and women? This caused lots of problems, both for parents and for children in my experience. So once again, uh, cause lots of problems, both for parents and for children in my experience, then you have the answer already. <laughs> but I would say uh, the act of sex so we have to distinguish also um yeah like sex i mean building a family um sexuality for the sake of procreation and sexuality as an act so i think it's very important to understand that there is um actually a lot of, of the buddha's disciples um female disciples were also prostitutes courtesans sex workers um, and the Buddha never said, for example, absolutely, that is like, you know, horrible, <laughs> wrong livelihood, you should not be doing it, and so forth, or you're going to go to hell. So where are we getting those taboos, I would say, is a very interesting question to ask ourselves. Um, nor do I ever see the Buddha being reported to tell people to have sex for the sake of procreation. So let's distinguish, let's distinguish those things. And um, yeah, I would say that because I don't see the Buddha reprimanding <laughs> any of the, um, yeah, any, anyone, <laughs> any of the courtesans, for example, or the sex workers uh, in terms of their sexual conduct, I don't think there is, I don't think it's the definition, doesn't seem to me that it's the definition of sexual misconduct to have sex outside marriage. Um, and um, multiple partners, yes, that was very much the case actually at the time of the Buddha. <laughs> so it was not, um, yeah, it was very, very common to have multiple partners. Um, and that was just the way things were. So we can make, you know, our sort of evaluation of the situation and absolutely if one thinks that if one sees uh, that that has caused lots of problems for parents and for children yeah probably it's something that one shouldn't get involved with um, and at the same time one can see instead what are the sort of uh, actions that have led to um, happiness and um, for both parents and children and kind of follow through with that. <laughs> and another person asks, is there anything in the Buddha's teachings or from other Buddhist teachers about how one should react to someone who participates in sexual misconduct from cheating on a partner to sexual coercion, abuse and rape, particularly the victim, how they should respond? If one should respond to the person who did the misconduct with compassion, how can we truly acknowledge that the action was unwholesome in line with right livelihood? And how can we show true compassion to the victims of those actions if misconduct is perhaps allowed or dismissed with an excuse that the person participated in the misconduct due to their conditioning? Thank you so much for this question. This is very important. Yes, um, I would go uh, back actually to the Sabhasava Sutta. Um, so where the Buddha actually offers a lot of different um ways essentially to uh transcend the asavasa so transcend the influences transcend um you know all of the the taints fundament fundamentally and uh i remember when i first encountered that sutta like my kind of idea or perception uh that so in order to be a good pra buddhist practitioner uh the appropriate response was always to endure <laughs> and then once i encountered the uh, the Sabhasava Sutta, I realized that actually that is just one of the sort of methods that the Buddha talks about, and only in particular circumstances. And when in 
instead. One is in, for example, um, a situation where one is either um, harmed or one is like either like in a sort of situation rather than harm, where one is in a situation of danger. Uh, to actually not voluntarily get into that. The Buddha says that those are things to be transcended by avoidance. So he encourages us monastics, for example, um, if we're going to the forest and we know that there are wild elephants in that part of the forest, we don't go where the wild elephants are. If there's a poison snake, we don't go to the poison snake. It's like, avoid that. <laughs> so we don't want to intentionally put ourselves in harm's way right? So it's the same thing. If we're in harm's way, well, we try to avoid that. We try to get away from that. Then, of course, if we're stuck, uh, then ideally, uh, we we try to, uh, as much as possible, uh, react with a mind of loving kindness. But we don't want to, you know, get like actually put ourselves in a position where people are sewing our limbs, right? <laughs> if people at a certain point are sewing our limbs, then we want to, as much as possible, if we can do that, um, develop a mind of loving kindness towards them, but not go into that situation voluntarily. That's crazy. <laughs> so we should remove ourselves from the situation. So that has to do with any type of, um, for example, situation of domestic violence, of uh, domestic abuse, of, um, yeah, of, yeah, sexual coercion, rape, and so forth. Absolutely get out of that. If we see someone who is in that situation, absolutely not to advise to stay in that situation. It's actually very compassionate to avoid that, to get out of that situation, both for the person who is, um, uh, quote unquote, the victim of the situation, and also for the sort of, quote unquote, uh, like, perpetrator of the violence uh, because by actually being in that situation we're enabling that person to commit bad karma we absolutely don't want to do that why would we want for someone to keep on doing bad karma that is not a compassionate action to do it whether it's for like whether that person is doing bad karma to our to ourselves or whether that person is doing bad karma to another so absolutely i would say that that is an asava to be transcended by avoidance so removing ourselves from the situation and trying to help anyone who is that in that situation to also acknowledge it. There can be, um, yeah, a lot of uh, psychological issues. As, for example, people who are victims of incest, um, the sort of uh, standard thing that can happen, people who are victims of rape, there can be a lot of uh, sense of guilt um, idea that they're responsible for the situation, right? And so it's difficult for them to actually make the appropriate response there. So if we're aware of that, um, the first encouragement should be for the person to remove themselves from there to like uh, get in a situation of safety. And then if and when once they're um, safe to try to let go of the anger uh, from that per towards that person. But first and foremost, I would say the, the first most compassionate thing is to uh, stop uh, the violence and um, prevent also that person from actually making, um, like being violent towards others as well. That's very, 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 very important. And I feel like a lot of times, unfortunately, then out of ignorance, there is a, a suggestion instead to endure the situation. And that is not kind, neither for oneself nor for others. And, oh, the other person that had asked earlier about sex outside marriage uh, says, I was not talking about sex workers. I'm talking about ordinary men and women living in London. Um, yeah, no problem. Thank you for, for specifying that. Yes, I was using the um, example the sex workers because they're clearly not in um a relationship <laughs> sorry in um yeah, actually they're not in a formal relationship and they are definitely not married <laughs> so it's not that um we see the buddha going oh okay well you have to have sex if you're married unless you're a sex worker uh, there's none of that um in the suttas so once again the emphasis is on non-harming 
uh, the emphasis is not, um, yeah, not, not doing anything that harms oneself or others. Uh, the emphasis is making sure that there is consent um, in every single, you know, being that is connected, obviously, to the beings that are having sexual intercourse. So then, of course, if one has children, also has to think about the implications that their actions will have on their children um, and so forth. So understanding each one of us has different particular uh, family predicaments. Um, so, yeah, I think that's also why maybe the the teachings um, also are not too detailed, but actually give us uh, a general guidance because otherwise, I mean, we would, every single person has a very specific sort of predicament. <laughs> so we see that the Dhamma is universal. It's not like a manual of psychology of like all the different iterations that there can be. And, you know, if you're born there or you're born there, or if like this or that, but rather it's a sort of, it's a principle. And it's part of our Dharma practice to understand um, how to put it in, yeah, how to practice it. Okay, and uh, the questions in the chat are over. So if there's any other um, comment or question live, we have a few minutes. You can also disagree, by the way. <laughs> you can also say, uh, Ayasoma, everything you've said is rubbish. I don't agree. You're going to go to hell. Well, hopefully not. <laughs> but yeah, if you perceive that there is wrong view and you have uh, also resources for that wrong view, I'm very happy to hear feedback. All right, maybe that's all <laughs> for this session. So I believe that Shell had a few um, announcements. Thank you so much, Aya. Um, thank you so much for the beautiful and peaceful meditation earlier and for your wisdom and your advice on a very complex topic this evening. It's so inspiring to hear from you, another Bikuni and a close friend of Anukampa. And we're so fortunate to be offered the teachings of early Buddhism. We're so grateful, Ayasoma, that you've given your time to help us with our two aims at Anukampa, to promote the teachings and practices of early Buddhism leading to full awakening and help to establish the first forest monastery in England where women can take full Bikuni ordination. Thank you so, so much, Aya, for your support in Anukampa. We're full of metta for Venerable Chanda Terry, who is now on her Vasa retreat in Perth. She sends metta to us all and is full of happiness for the community. All these teachings are offered in the spirit of dana, generosity. If you are able, we are asking for your dana, generosity, towards Anukampa. We have seen the project flourish this year and we wish to continue to support the Bikuni Sangha in the UK and start raising funds to expand from our beautiful Vihara in Oxford to an even bigger abode to house more Bikunis, aspirants and lay supporters. Without the support of the community here this evening and the wider community, we wouldn't be where we are today, spreading the teachings of the Buddha to all. If you can, we are asking for monetary donations to support the expansion of Anukampa. However small or big you are able to give, every penny is so gratefully received to support the Bikuni Sangha and get even closer to having a full forest monastery for Bikunis in the UK. Please visit the website to donate and the link is being posted in the chat. You can offer a one-off donation or more regular monthly donations that will really support the project. Please also see the Anu Campbell website for the weekly teachings. We're being offered by the wonderful Bikunis and Ajahn Brahmali again, supporting Anu Kampa while Ven Venerable Chanda Terry is on retreat, as well as Ajahn Brahm's teachings in November in the UK and Venerable Chanda's retreats and talks she'll be given on her return in the UK, US and Norway. Her retreat next February at Gaia House in Devon, UK is now open for booking and you can find the link on the Anu Campbell website and all other retreats should be open for booking later this year. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. 
And thank you again, Ayasoma, for your time and your wisdom. My so pleasure. In true, <laughs> in a true Anacampa style, we will unmute everyone um, so that we can say goodbye to each other.